Sure, thank you so much for having me. I'm Becca Wolf. Um, I'm an attorney here in Santa Fe. Uh, I know many of you because I was born and raised in Santa Fe. And um, I work for the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center, which, whose uh, main office is in Albuquerque, but we have a satellite office here in Santa Fe. And we represent um, low income ing immigrants in all kinds of uh, providing all kinds of legal services, um, both those who are in facing deportation and also those who have other kinds of humanitarian relief. Um, I have been focusing my time on the Cibola Detention Center, which is in Grants, New Mexico, um, and have been coordinating with Allegra the um, uh, project for program for access to legal services. We just wanted a good acronym, was really the deal. So the name is done, but it's PALS. Um, we're disarmingly sweet. Um, and and I, I, now I can't remember what the acronym stands for. And I also um, represent um, uh, people in, in, in removal proceedings, with people facing deportation. Um, I'm a legger, thanks. I am the director of San Hedrimers. We do so much at our office, um, but I think it's really, I'm probably gonna be talking a lot about um, our work in the courts and in detention and political asylum today. But I, I think Marcelo will be glad for me to point out, we do about 800 cases a year, and I would probably say 700 of them are from New Mexicans who live in Santa Fe and in the state of New Mexico. So sometimes our work is like, we do so much cool, cool shit on the border. Oh, God, he told me not to curse, but I'm... <laughs> <laughs> took, it took less than a minute. <laughs> we do so much cool stuff on the border, but like, like literally 90% of our clients come from here in Santa Fe, Rio Arriba, Albuquerque. We have offices in Santa Fe, Albuquerque, and now in El Paso. Uh, we focus on all sorts of um, processes for immigration. Uh, we do like cases to help people with like, DACA, citizenship, green cards, U visas, special immigrant, juvenile visas, violence against women act, all that kind of stuff. And also a lot of political asylum. We do a, a special amount of work with um, transgender women detained not only here in Cibola County, but also all over the Southwest. Um, we work in, we've been working for the last year um, with the American Immigration Council to um, reunite separated families from the, the policy last summer. And most recently my staff has been down in the family detention facilities in South Texas. And we spent a lot of time on the caravan this fall as well, one of the caravans, I should say. And so I can help answer questions about those policies. We're also working right now with um, the courts in El Paso and how they're dealing with asylum seekers who are being returned um, to Mexico when they come seeking asylum, the, the migrant protection policy, or migrant protection protocol. Thank you. Um, thank you to the league for getting us all here and doing what you do so well, and to the church for Accommodating us and to everybody for coming out today. I think uh, this is a significant, if not the most significant, uh, moral issue uh, of our time. Uh, I hope a little bit later to have a chance to put it into more context historically, but uh, I think we all know that right now what's happening in the country and, and around the world, uh, dealing with immigrant issues, the rights of immigrants, and the morality of how we deal with immigrants is something that challenges everybody everywhere. Uh, Santa Fe uh, has a long and very uh, positive history of speaking and acting on this uh, issue. And I won't take credit for all the work of the people who did this way before I got into the mayor's office. Uh, but I will say that uh, sitting in the mayor's office is a uh, unique opportunity to see the the field in front of us and all the people who want to help. Everybody who is here wants to help. The faith-based community in Santa Fe wants to help. The nonprofit community wants to help. The immigrant rights community wants to help. I think it's also important, and I think Marcel will speak to this, that we not lose sight of the longer and bigger game that is going on in the country right now. Uh, what's happening with asylum seekers uh, is really important and we're going to do the right thing and we're going to help them and we're going to stand up the, the resources, the people, and the uh, facilities that, that these asylum seekers need. At the same time, 
we have an immigrant community in Santa Fe and in northern New Mexico that every single day needs to be looked after and protected. Uh, we have to remember that uh, wage theft continues. Uh, we have to remember that I-9 raids continue and people are being yanked out of hotel, restaurants, and other hospitality uh, operations, businesses in Santa Fe, and whatever else goes on, those people are just as important as the, the asylum seekers who are coming here to look for our help and deserve our help. Hi. Uh, my name is Marcela. I work for Somos Un Pueblo Mido. It's wonderful to see a lot of familiar faces here who have been in this fight with us uh, and in our struggle with us, really, for um, for decades. And so thank you for coming and wanting to learn more and, and do more. Uh, so I'm also, I'm just going to introduce Somos, and then I think I'm going to toss it back to the mayor. Is that right? Is that right? Oh. Well, I guess we'll find out as we go along. <laughs> Are you? Do you want to say I think more about your Somos, Yes, of course. Somos Un Pueblo Unido, we're a community-based organization, um, and I have the incredible pleasure of working day in and day out with folks who uh, live and work in our community, who are families, who are um, who are dealing with a lot of the, the challenges of this uh, presidential administration, had to deal with many challenges before that, at every level, city level, state level, federal level, um, but who day in and day out uh, decide to fight, to work collectively, to make our community stronger, not just for uh, immigrant families, mixed status immigrant families, but for all of us who live in this state. And so I always uh, want to talk about the strength of our community uh, and the activism, the incredible activism. And uh, I will, I guess at some point later on, I talk a little bit about some of the, um, you know, some of the policies that our that our members really worked hard to, to pass at the state level during this last legislative session. So a little bit of a legislative update that really I think reflects the uh, complexity of our lives. Uh, you know, we're, we're not just a passport or a, or a social security number or a, or a status. Uh, we are workers. We are parents. We are people living in the community who are doing. Um, who are contributing a lot, but who are also facing greater challenges when it comes to uh, racism and poverty and structural inequality in our communities. Um, but there were things that we weren't, you know, there were a lot of really great things that we were able to pass in the state legislature, a lot of things that we weren't, um, that will continue to leave a lot of families and children unprotected uh, in the state and very vulnerable to uh, arrest, and, uh, detention, and deportation and separation from families. And so that weighs. Uh, heavily on us, and so of course we will uh, call upon all of you to help Santa Fe once again be a strong leader when it comes to uh, creating common sense sanctuary policies uh, at the at the state level. Um, and I just wanted to let you know, if if you don't know, that it's almost is a statewide organization. We have eight membership teams that are steered. Uh, in eight counties, a horseshoe around the Rio Grande corridor, in many semi-rural and rural communities. Um, these membership teams that steer our work are immigrant mixed status families, uh, Native American families in McKinley County who are dealing with workers' rights issues, and, uh, and so we are changing the face of our state, we are changing uh, the world, and so it's exciting to be able to share some of that. Uh, we have an office here in Santa Fe with staff, our worker center. Uh, we have had for a number of years now a uh, headquarters, a satellite office in Roswell, New Mexico, where we also have a strong membership team and staff. And we just opened up our third office in Lee County, um, which is Hawks, where we're doing a lot of organizing work around uh, voter engagement, uh, pushing back against collaboration between local law enforcement, local jails, and ICE, and so uh, we're growing, and that's in part because of the incredible support that we have in Santa Fe. So, uh, not just Santa Fe, but uh, businesses across uh, the state and the country um, continue to see an uptick in I-9 audits, uh, which, you know, appears on its face as something that seems harmless, right? We're just, we're not coming in and asking everybody about their status. We're coming in and asking, you know, an individual, a manager, a human resources person, an owner, for 
their documentation um, to, to see if everything is in order, to see if people's social security numbers match their names. Uh, and so we're, we're of course seeing an increase of this across the state, and Santa Fe is no exception. And it is incredibly harmful um, to communities. Uh, it's obvious, for obvious reasons, it can really destabilize <laughs> uh, and upend a business, uh, especially as we're going into a high tourist season in, in a place like Santa Fe. Uh, but it's mostly upending and destabilizing for our families. And it doesn't often result in an immediate arrest and detention uh, of a, a worker. Uh, but it leaves open the possibility that families will get a knock on the door at 6 in the morning with an arrest warrant because the information that was obtained uh, by ICE was obtained through those I-9 um, documents and other documents. And so this, uh, coupled with an overall uptick of ICE enforcement across the country, is uh, something that we really need to get a handle on. And when it first started in Santa Fe, um, I think it's fine to call them I-9 raids because, in a way, uh, that's what it feels like when uh, you are working for a company and you are living paycheck to paycheck and you are counting uh, on a certain income. Uh, there, you know, there's some stability in that and when all of a sudden ICE pays your employer a visit and you find out about it, it, it you, know, you have to quickly decide what it is that you're going to do. And that's when you find out about it. Um, the mayor and I were talking a little bit beforehand about how um, back, you know, a year and a half ago when the city co-sponsored with our groups, all of our groups, um, workshops, not just for workers but also employers about things that they can do, you know, the absolute minimum that they could do to comply with these requests because oftentimes when they don't know their rights as employers, um, they can put their employees in harm's way. Um, you know, our, our membership, in doing that, said, look, we this is a mutually beneficial relationship, workers, that we have with our hospitality industry and our businesses in Santa Fe. And so, you know, we expect that you will notify us, um, that you will not turn over the documents, that you will notify us with, with time, because uh, usually it takes a month to sit, at least to sit through the documents and to interact with the employer once um, those I-9 those I nine forms have been turned over to ICE. Uh, you know, that way we have an opportunity to figure out if we're going to get a new job, if we're going to go see an immigration attorney, um, you know, what we're going to do for our families. Yeah. But unfortunately, um, that hasn't happened in most of the I-9 audits that we've become aware of. What happens is um, employees are told, um, don't worry, there's nothing to worry about. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, and there's a rumor that ICE did an I-9 audit, but in fact, um, that's not the case. Don't worry about it, everything's going to be fine. It was just an IRS audit that happened recently at a hotel that I won't name. <laughs> but um, you'll name it, very good. <laughs> uh, or maybe the mayor will name it, I don't know. Yeah, Mark, I-9 is an immigration document that if you're an employer, every employer fills it out when someone is hired, where you examine proof that they have a right to legally work in the United States. You have to fill it out when you have an employee, not a contractor an employee, and you have to keep them on your premises or have them available if immigration wants to come inspect them. If you're a citizen, you probably don't notice this when it's happening when you're filling out your paperwork. If you're an immigrant, it's a tense moment. And, and you know, with different kinds of status, obviously. A lot of immigrants um, in, 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 in Santa Fe, and let me just close this up, um, Meredith, okay. if you don't mind. Uh, in, in Santa Fe, about a third of our foreign born population are U.S. citizens naturalized, about a third are undocumented, and about a third um, have some form of lawful status um, that can be temporary or they can be permanent. And so all of that goes in the I-9 document, and when uh, an employer is uh, audited, they uh, can do a lot of things um, to not turn over the information right away, they don't, I mean, there's just a whole sort of series of information that employers need to know. But the problem is that the I-9 document often, it contains people's addresses, it contains information, and so that's the information that ICE um, has, so they can go and find people afterwards. But then also they tell the employer, um, look, these 20 people out of your 80 employees 
um, the, this, this status isn't right, and so um, you can help us get them, and that's when sometimes employers will call people in to human resources departments with, you know, an ISIS sitting there. That just happened very recently with um, an individual at a local hotel. She just thought she was going in for a regular, and she was just called into the human resources department. She had no reason to suspect that ICE would be there, and when they were there, they questioned her, and now she's in um, removal proceedings. And so, uh, so this is, this is happening in Santa Fe, and employers are not always doing what they should be doing. Uh, and so we have to figure out as a city how we're going to hold them accountable. Um, and, and, and again, they don't want to spook off half of their employees, yeah. right? And so this is what they're doing. So um, they also, what they'll do is they'll fire from one day, one day to the next. And that's why we're demanding that they notify employees so that at the very least, if they choose to, or if they're going to be terminated or if they choose to leave their job, which many will do, they at least have an opportunity to figure out what their next plan is, what their next job is going to be. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what happens and what's been happening in Santa Fe is they all show up one day um, and say, you know what, a, year, a month and a half ago we got this and we're going to have to let you know half of you go and from one day to the next after having trained some of their replacements they um, they lose their job and their income and that impacts their families and it impacts all of them yeah we are following the um, sanctuary city resolution which uh, is the strongest in the country and a model for other communities to follow uh, when i first became mayor I sat down with our Police Chief, Chief Padilla, and we walked through it, we talked through what our police officers are expected to do and expected not to do. Uh, they have uh, conducted at least one uh, joint training with SOMOS that I'm aware of uh, to make sure that the, 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 the representatives of the immigration community and law enforcement uh, understand each other and talk to each other and feel like they can uh, work with each other. Uh, I was very proud early on in my term as mayor when there was that potentially inflammatory situation involving uh, not an uh, immigrant but an African American uh, medical student who was shopping at a uh, the equivalent of a convenience store. And the uh, clerk called the police and tried to have the gentleman arrested. And our police came, and uh, you can still hear the, the uh, recording if you want to. Uh, our officer said to the young man, you're free to go. We have something here in Santa Fe called the Constitution. Ah. And we follow it. Um, these are potentially inflammatory moments, and we'll, I'm sure we'll make some mistakes, but I think it, the heart and soul of our police department is uh, well aware of what the city's resolution on uh, sanctuary city status means, and they're also very aware of the boundaries with ICE. Another event that happened early on in my experience as mayor was that ICE uh, put in a call to our police department claiming that there was a um, potential uh, situation on one of our schools that could have been dangerous, and they wanted the police to go in and bring the ICE agents with them, and the police said, you know, we don't have any reason to believe that what you're telling us is uh, authentic or factual, and we are not going to act as a ferry service to give you uh, the ability to get in, in, into places where under our sanctuary city uh, ordinance you're not supposed to come. We also, uh, Marcel and I worked collaboratively early on in my term around some very, very troubling experiences where ICE agents were pulling over people they had targeted. Uh, they knew where they were living and they were waiting for them to get on the road in their car and then pulling them over and pretending to be Santa Fe police officers. And using the inauthentic um, identity of uh, police officers to demand people's driver's licenses and other information. I wrote a letter to ICE's regional office and um, asked for an explanation. I forwarded that same letter to our congressional delegation, which had a little more clout than I have, and we never got a satisfactory answer, but I think for the most part we've seen those kinds of stops uh, no longer taking place. We also uh, rely on our immigration committee quite heavily 
to uh, bring issues like that to the city's attention. And the resolution that you mentioned, just a small little factual correction, was not passed on Wednesday night, it was introduced on Wednesday night. Oh, okay. And it will go through the Immigration Committee to be amended, improved, um, and then uh, moved to the Finance Committee and then come to the Council for a vote. Um, essentially, that resolution reconfirms our commitment to be a partner with all the other players, not only in Santa Fe, but around the state, toward responding to this particular issue that is capturing so much of our time, energy, um, emotion, and resources, and that is dealing with the, the situation right now with uh, asylum seekers coming into, into New Mexico. Okay, okay, good. Retake Our Democracy, who is here tonight, uh, this afternoon, uh, is accepting all kinds of uh, contributions, non-monetary, but of uh, the other things that people need, uh, who are being sheltered in Albuquerque and in Las Cruces. A new energy economy is, a, is a, a, a moment, a place where you can take uh, whatever you can contribute. There's a list on the uh, website of Retake of the things that have been asked for most specifically. Uh, and I got a list from Mary Keller as well. And we'll continue to be more uh, better organized and better at distributing these resources. Um, we have a very generous community. Uh, the day after we got into the newspapers suggesting that Santa Fe was very much uh, partnering with and participating in doing the right thing, uh, we got offers of money, we got offers of help from hotels who often have personal care items they just have, you know, they don't need for the long run, they use them and then uh, there's extras left over. Um, we got offers of help in language. Uh, there's people coming through from Brazil. We've got Spanish speakers who are a little less well equipped with Portuguese speakers. Um, the list continues, but the point is money, tangible items, personal care items, things for kids, formula, uh, diapers, um, the things that families need are really important. And it is, it is really ratchet. My, our hearts uh, were overruled by our heads on this decision. Uh, the, the, the instinct is, how do we get into this quickly? How do we make the most impact? And we were ready to, to go to it with a uh, housing and shelter program. And then we looked at it and we analyzed it. It's a systems problem and a logistics problem as much as it is a human problem. And to have people come all the way up to Santa Fe by bus and then go back to Albuquerque by bus in order to go to Denver by bus, really, uh, it didn't make a lot of logistical sense. DACA is still a policy. It is current in the sense that people who have their deferred action can still renew it. And we have hundreds and hundreds of people in Santa Fe County who are doing that. And it's wonderful. Hundreds? Hundreds of people. Hundreds or something like that? No, I don't, I don't, don't, I don't, we don't know the number. No idea. Um, but certainly enough that we see about 400 people come through our legal clinics every year to do that renewal. Not everyone in the county comes to us, so I imagine there's quite a few more. Um, however, the, 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 the president was challenging DACA. I mean, this is sort of, nothing has changed since in like the last year. So the president was challenging his ability to totally cancel the executive order that initially granted people DACA. And um, it went through the courts, and the Supreme Court is not hearing it this, this um, term, this session. And so that the, it, it remains in limbo as an executive order, and people can still renew it and keep their work permit and their protection from deportation, but there can't be any new um, people registering. And in fact, I saw on the news the other day, I think 100,000 people who would have otherwise qualified for DACA graduating high school this year without it, which is really a, a shame. Um, and so now it's on our Congress to sort of create that opportunity. The president has set this up by saying, well, if you want to protect dreamers, our Congress has to do it. And that's been a pretty bitter fight for the, um, the last 15 years. And so hopefully there's going to be a DREAM Act coming up in the legislation. The, if, you, if you're interested in learning more about what's going on, then connecting with uh, local affiliates from United We Dream, the New Mexico Dream Team, they really, really um, have 
they're doing a lot of work in the community. And it's also affected by the DACA issue is, is this thing called Temporary Protective Status, TBS, where um, there's a whole class of people from several different identified countries, uh, like uh, Honduras, El Salvador, I think Haiti, are some of the ones on the chopping block, that you get the same sort of protection as DACA. It's a it's extended by the executive branch, it's extended by executive order for protection from deportation to your home country. And um, the president also tried to cancel those programs, but there's been a recent extension. And so there's protection continuing because this is all getting clogged up in the courts. This is what, like, the executive attacked. Everyone's sued for injunctions. The injunctions are here, and now we're all in this like injunctive limbo, waiting for the courts to decide what, what all is going to happen. Just to piggyback on that, uh, I, I sort of, and when I was invited to speak on this panel, and I know like I was similar, had a similar position, we, we sort of pushed back even at the framing. Right? I don't want to frame, me personally, speaking in my personal capacity, I don't want to frame this as an issue of a border crisis or as an issue of comprehensive and fair immigration reform. I don't think that there are good people that deserve immigration benefits and bad people that don't deserve them. I think that our problem in the way that we've been addressing immigration in this country is that we're trying to fit into these categories that don't make any sense on the ground. They don't make any sense. So I, I, I wanted, I was wondering if you would do an, a little bit of an exercise with me. Oh, yeah. Are you willing? I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can you just, and you don't have to, it's okay, but if you're willing to participate, will you just raise your hand if you have ever traveled outside the United States? <laughs> and will you keep your hand raised if you did so, even if you weren't benefiting the country that you were traveling to, except maybe that you were going to spend some money in a hotel. <laughs> and keep your hand raised if in order to do that you had to apply for a visa ahead of time, or, well, let's do it the end. I, I confuse you. Keep your hand raised if you got to just show up with your passport. Ever. Keep your hand raised if you didn't even have to think about how long you were allowed to stay there before your visa expired. <laughs> Nobody, if you have gone to Mexico and weren't like, whoa, I'd better be careful because it's only three months. I actually have no idea how long a Mexican visa is. <laughs> it's forever. It's forever. Okay. So you can put your hands down. What I want us to get to is a position in which we realize that that makes no sense. That you, because you happen to have, have a, a US passport either because you were born here or because of some other relationship to this country, get to travel to other places without having to prove your economic uh, uh, benefit to that place without having to prove your tie. Raise your hand if you had to prove that you had a connection to Cancun before you got to go to Cancun. <laughs> or that you had money in the bank, that you had to present your bank, bank uh, records in order to demonstrate that you had enough money to sustain yourself going to Mexico. Because <laughs> you don't. Wait, I'm not done. No, okay. so, so my point is, is that Immigration policy is fundamentally migration policy. And when we frame it as either a legal system or, at worst, a criminalized system, where there are things that you do that are illegal in migration, you are turning the con we're cutting off half of the conversation, which is what, is, what would a real migration policy look like uh, for this continent or this world? And the truth is, is that if you can't come up with a non-racialized, non-classist, for lack of a better word, sorry, uh, description of why it is okay for everyone in this room that raised their hand to go to Chile or Mexico or Costa Rica or, I don't know, where do I want to go? Uh, there's another program in the United States, for example, where you can be from South of Africa or Australia, or England, or a fair number of other European or English-speaking countries. They've got these great programs where you can come and work at a summer camp for free in the United States in exchange for a visa. 
right? It's, it's this very outward, it's this very cool program, I don't understand it, I worked at a summer camp with a bunch of these folks, right? They get, they get permission to come and work. Um, we don't have a similar position, we don't have a similar system for people to come and work from Central America, even though they are closer, they have more economic ties to our country than a 19-year-old from Australia ostensibly does. Um, so if we can't actually articulate what the reason is that that, is, that of that, like why there is that distinction, then I would disagree that it's about visiting versus staying. I mean, if you look at the statistics of the number of people, who, Americans who live illegally in Mexico because they have a second home there, that's actually quite a significant number of people. But we don't talk about it in the same way that we talk about migration to this country. So I'd like you to keep that in your mind as we talk about immigration and immigration policy.